welcome, welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the uh, William E. Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Uh, delighted to have you here. John Hamry, CSIS President, is traveling in Asia this week, but he asked me to add his uh, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. In addition to the large audience we have in the room, we also I want to welcome and recognize our online viewers. We have quite a devoted following. And uh, those of you who want to follow us on Twitter, you can find us at CSIS. Um, Larry Summers uh, once said that he could imagine, the former US Treasury Secretary, of course, uh, said that he could imagine a world, a future in which the US uh, and China are both successful. And he could imagine a future in which neither the US nor China is successful. But he could not imagine a future in which one succeeds and the other fails. Um, as usual, Larry, a boss of mine twice, uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think he really uh, highlighted the fact that these two uh, economies' destinies are intertwined, for better or for worse. So um, we talk in Washington a lot about when two large bodies like the United States and China uh, converge, uh, there is naturally friction. And certainly, uh, there are challenges in this relationship. Uh, and it would be foolish to deny that or not to try to take on those challenges. But it would also be foolish not to talk about the many benefits that both countries have enjoyed in this relationship uh, that has been growing uh, so dramatically over the past 30 years. Um, and to acknowledge the potential gains that uh, we could have uh, in our relationship going forward if we address the challenges, if we look for uh, opportunities to exploit complementarities in our economies uh, and, to, um, and to find areas where we can cooperate. And it's in that spirit that we're organizing this event here uh, at CSIS uh, with the um, kind and generous sponsorship of the China-United States Exchange Foundation in Hong Kong. Um, we have a terrific lineup of speakers and presenters uh, to discuss and explore these issues. Uh, you have a report in front of you uh, produced by uh, the China-U.S. Uh, Exchange Foundation, which uh, covers many of these issues, and we're going to talk about that uh, shortly. Um, let me give you a quick overview of today's events. Uh, in a moment, I will introduce um, our first speaker to make some introductory remarks. Uh, then you will hear from a distinguished uh, group of presenters about the report and about some of the issues that arise from it. Uh, then we will have a panel discussion uh, on these, uh, these topics, uh, followed by questions and answers. Um, and then we will take a short break and then have our two keynote presentations. Uh, and finally, uh, all of that should wrap up around 12.15, and then we will have a lunch uh, served um, in the back, uh, which uh, you can all stay and enjoy. So uh, with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite to the podium uh, Mr. Tung Chi Hua, better known to most of us here as C.H. Tung, uh, who is chairman of the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation uh, and also uh, the uh, person responsible for uh, the report that you have in front of you and for this, uh, this occasion. So C.H., with no further ado, please come up. Matt, uh, many friends here, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm always happy to, to come to Washington. Um, to be honest, always intimidated <laughs> as the day began. Uh, normally, I would prepare very thoroughly on everything that need, will be raised, on every issue I would want to cover, on the messages I want to bring to Washington. And very often, on a whole subject, the issue from A to Z, what I need to bring out. Uh, when I got here, the first thing I would learn is that 
what do you want to talk about? Nobody is interested here. <laughs> Washington has its own ways, has its own agenda, uh, has its own, own momentum about issues. And uh, so you have to, to know how when you come to Washington and get on with the things you want to get on. And it, it is really a tremendously intellectually stimulating experience to be in Washington. Uh, because you eventually, at the end of the day, you want to get through what you want to tell people. And it's a lot of hard work, my friends. But I always went away enriched. And the reason why is that you're willing to engage. You're willing to listen. You, you're eventually willing to listen. And and uh, I would go away wiser. Uh, and I hope, having listened to me, you would think this is worthwhile. So, but today I just I came not with just by myself. I came with a team of experts, team of experts, who actually know this subject a lot better than I do. So um, I hope uh, you will enjoy listening to them, talking to them, asking questions, have communication. And I hope uh, we all go away uh, wealthier uh, in terms of knowing how important US-China relationship has become and how important this economic relationship between the two countries is and how much it not only can help to create economic vigor, uh, economic opportunity, but also create millions and jobs for both countries. Uh, but more than that, such an economic relationship can really help US-China to move ahead on the overall relationship of these two countries. Uh, the United States and China are two very different countries with different histories and cultures. They are also at different stages of development, one being the largest developing nation and the other being the largest developing nation in the world, each of substantial economic size and therefore each contribute to global economic activities in different ways. Working together, we can do more in such areas as global economic recovery and financial stability. Furthermore, US and China are the two largest trading nations in the world. Working together, we can help to further liberalize trade of goods and services around the world. The fact is, whether it is in energy security, food safe sufficiency, protection of the environment, climate change, and nuclear weapon proliferation, fighting terrorism, preventing epidemics or drug trafficking, all of these and other transnational challenges that the world faces today require multilateral efforts. But if US and China work together on any of these issues, the chances of success will be enhanced. It is for all the above reasons that from a global perspective, US-China relationship is the most important international relationship today. From a bilateral respect, uh, perspective, the economic relationship between the United States and China has developed over the past few decades from virtually non-existent. Uh, Henry Kissinger was saying to me yesterday when, when they met uh, early in 1971 uh, in Beijing, the, the, the size of trade between China and the United States uh, is smaller than the size of trade between the United States and El Salvador. And that was the relationship, uh, economic relationship at that time. But now, after a few de decades, this relationship has developed from virtually non-existent 
to becoming a highly interdependent and mutually beneficial one. As the two largest trading nations in the world, they are also each other's second largest trading partners. A vast volume of trade in goods, integrated supply chain, a growing volume of trading services, substantial direct American investment in China, and an even larger Chinese investment in U.S. Treasury securities speak to the importance of the relationship. On balance, the relationship is of tremendous mutual benefit. But the question we want to ask today is where is this economic relationship going in the future? To answer this question, the China-United States Exchange Foundation engage a group of eminent scholars with advice from academics, business, political leaders from both countries to undertake a study to examine the economic relationship. The study viewed the past, reviewed the past, examined the difficulties in the economic relationship that could impede increasing commerce between them, but most importantly, look into the future. The study concluded, and you will hear many of this being presented to you, but it concluded that, here I quote, both countries want to establish a pattern of secure, high quality, sustainable growth and employment for their people. And this study demonstrates that bilateral relationship built and adapted over time can make a material contribution to that shared goal. And there are many examples how US and China can cooperate with each other. But this is not my role to talk about it at this moment. What I do want to say to you is that you will enjoy listening to the, to the presentation that is going to be made to you. Uh, I want you to really think about this. Uh, I hope <coughs> we can at least give you some food for thought as to how important this economic relationship is. And also I want you to hopefully to think in terms of not only the, the economic opportunities and the uh, job creation that can come about because of a better relationship economically, but how this better economic relationship can make a real difference to the overall relationship of the two countries, because that is really important, as Matt said early on, that relationship it is really the most important relationship on Earth. So if, um, if uh, on a multilateral basis there's reason for us to be together, on bilateral basis there's reason for us to be together, uh, then there is no reason why we cannot get on with it. And uh, I look forward to, to, to be sitting down there, listening to everybody, hearing your questions, and uh, I'm sure uh, after uh, the lunch this afternoon, I will go away a wiser person uh, and uh, come back again to Washington with renewed energy to bang my head and to get things happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, C.H. Um, and um, if I could now invite the, uh, the three speakers uh, to come up to the stage. So I think Larry, um, uh, my mind has gone blank, Mike, and uh, Mr. Wong. Uh, where's Mr. Wong? Mr. Wong's here. Yes, there he is. Please come on up. Okay. 
So uh, as I mentioned and CH mentioned, um, this report that you have in front of you on U.S.-China economic relations in the next 10 years uh, was uh, produced by a, a very distinguished group of, uh, of experts based in Hong Kong, but with some advice from, from a, a number of other uh, experts around the world. And here's a, uh, 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 the, the, the inner core of that group uh, who, were, who were responsible for, for uh, most of the hard work. And it was a lot of very hard work, believe me, um, uh, and uh, lots of late nights um, over the past year or so. Um, so let me, I, I'm delighted to introduce uh, the, three, the three presenters who will talk about the report and the issues in it. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Lawrence Lau, uh, to my immediate left, your right, uh, who is the Ralph and Claire Landau Professor of Economics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and also the Kuo Ting Lee Professor in Economic Development Emeritus at Stanford University, where he uh, worked for 30 plus years, I think, closer to 40 maybe. Um, which is hard to believe. He started when he was a teenager, uh, clearly. Um, uh, Larry will speak first in a moment, but let me just uh, move down the line. Uh, next to him is Michael Spence, uh, also I think a well-known uh, person to, to everyone here, professor of economics uh, at the Leonard N. Stern School of Business at New York University, and also recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. Uh, so Mike will speak uh, after Larry. And then at the end, we have Dr. Wang Chunzhang, who is the Executive Vice Chairman of the China Center for International Economic Exchanges and former Director of the Economic and Financial Leader, uh, Leading Group of uh, the People's Republic of China. And Dr. Wang will speak uh, after Mike. So with no further, and you have more biographical information in your packet, which is why I uh, didn't go into detail, but there's a lot more distinguished background to each of these people, and I would uh, encourage you to look at, look at those biographies. Uh, so with that, uh, Larry? Um, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, Mr. Tong, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, if I could get the uh, um, PowerPoint to work. Um, Always the technology. Uh, always the technology. <laughs> we had the same problem in New York, so. <laughs> um. It doesn't seem the power doesn't even. Oh, it is on there. Ah. Ah, there we go. Exceed your vision. <laughs> um, let me see if I could. Press the, okay. Uh, I, knew I, I knew I should have brought my magic tricks to entertain you while we were waiting. <laughs> Um, uh, well, maybe first of all, let me give you a uh, overview of the study. Um, the study actually consists of two parts, part one and part two. I think you have in front of you basically part one. Uh, part two actually consists of 19 chapters on various subjects, you know, uh, authored by uh, different experts, and it is, uh, it is available online, and it will be printed. Uh, you know, in a, in several weeks, okay, and and everybody here, uh, you know, if you would like a hot copy, uh, just let us know, and we'll send you uh, a hot copy. Um, basically, as Mr. Tong indicated, that uh, uh, what we like to do is uh, not just to review what happened in the past. I mean, this is about uh, China has actually been undertaking its reform. Uh, and opening to the world since 1978. Um, but uh, we, we, we had a review of the past, but mostly we would like to focus on the future, on what the, uh, uh, the two countries what, uh, could, can accomplish uh, by through cooperation. 
Um, so anyway, uh, let me start now. Um, I will post this PowerPoint on my web page in a couple of days after I return to Hong Kong. But uh, it really covers uh, everything that I said here is actually in the report uh, somewhere. Um, okay. Um, the uh, I already the uh, already said that we have part one and and part two and the focus on the future potential of uh, U.S. China uh, cooperation. Um, well, the, the uh, in this study we have actually projected that the U.S. and Chinese economies will grow at uh, three percent, just below three percent for the U.S. and between seven and seven and a half percent for China over the next uh, next decade um, uh, we, we, we think that this you know it's, this can be accomplished achieved by both economies um, in 2022 uh, our projected US GDP is 21 trillion okay and the, and the projected Chinese GDP would be 17 trillion uh, both in uh, 2011 uh, I'm sorry 2012 prices um, However, uh, the, uh, in terms of per capita GDP, that would still be a huge gap. Uh, projected uh, U.S. per capita GDP would be around $63,000, and uh, for the Chinese per capita GDP, would be $12,000. I mean, still you know, less than the fifth of uh, U.S. GDP. Um, you can see here, this is basically the uh, projected uh, U.S. and China uh, GDP in 2012. Uh, the blue line is the U.S. GDP. The red line is the Chinese GDP. And uh, it's a rapid catching up, but uh, the U.S. is still uh, going to be uh, have a higher uh, real GDP. Um, this is the per capita GDP forecast. Uh, you can see that there's still a huge gap, despite the fact that the uh, Chinese GDP may, may appear to be to be growing uh, faster. Um, now, the next thing we like to talk about would be the economic complementarities that uh, both Matt and Mr. Tong mentioned. Uh, we know that the benefits of uh, economic exchange and uh, and 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 the uh, and interaction between two economies they are really maximized when they are the most different. When they are the most different. Okay, because then they really complement each other and the comparative advantages uh, have the least overlap. Now, if you really look at the factor proportions uh, and compare the factor proportions of the United States and China, uh, you will find that the, uh, uh, China has more, more people, more workers, <laughs> more labor. But in terms of the other uh, inputs, like tangible capital, arable land, R&D uh, capital, um, the U.S. is really way ahead, uh, uh, both in absolute values, but also in terms of proportion to the uh, to the uh, working age population. In terms of human capital, which is very which is very important, uh, in the United States, the percentage of the labor force that has had college education is around forty percent. In China, it is really just approaching ten uh, percent, not quite ten percent at this moment. Um, uh, we believe that the United S U.S. Uh, comparative advantage in intangible capital, intangible, not intangible capital, intangible capital meaning human capital and R&D capital, uh, and I think the U.S. would have a, a tremendous uh, advantage for another couple of decades at least, and perhaps uh, even longer. Um, this is just a table summarizing what I just said, and you could see that the uh, um, in, in terms of tangible capital, arable land per working age population, R and D capital stock, and uh, patents granted, you know the U.S. Uh, is still way ahead. Um, I think in 2012, the number of patents uh, granted to U.S. nationals in the in the United States is uh, was about 120,000, and the number of patents granted to Chinese nationals, you know. <laughs> You know, for patents granted in the United States is uh, is below 4,000. So that uh, gives you a sense of the difference. Now, even though I mean, the United States does have a home court advantage uh, in terms of patents uh, in the U.S. 
Um, another aspect of the complementarity is the fact that there's a huge difference in the saving rates. Um, the uh, U.S. gross savings rate is about 12 percent currently, um, and in China, the Chinese saving rate is approaches 50 percent. You know, it is certainly in the 40s, uh, but uh, in some years it would uh, possibly hit the 50s. Um, China saves too much and also invests too much, and the U.S. <laughs> saves too little. So, so there is actually room for both to benefit if the uh, excess Chinese savings could be uh, used to, uh, for, uh, to augment the investment uh, in, the, in the U.S. Now, and, um, and, and we believe that uh, on the basis of these complementarities that the United States and China should uh, conduct feasibility studies for a bilateral um, U.S.-China free trade area. Okay, by, by that, uh, now, this is not really meant to replace other efforts, you know, not the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or the uh, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six initiatives. Uh, but, you know, but it, I think it is a, uh, uh, you know, I think there's an idea that really can be pursued. And many people on our steering committee, executive committee, have been pushing uh, the idea of a feasibility study. We, we know that this is <laughs> going to take a long time, but, uh, uh, but I think it's just an idea that's worth, uh, worth studying. Um, the other thing that we believe that the United States and China should do is to try to conclude a bilateral investment treaty uh, you know, uh, as soon as possible so as to facilitate two-way investment. Uh, uh, be, be between the two countries, you know, not just U.S. investment to China, but also Chinese investment uh, to the U.S. Um, the uh, we believe that by 2022, the United States and China are likely to be each other's largest trading partner in in the world. Um, the uh, one of the chapters in our study is a chapter done by uh, Dr. Gary Hofbauer <laughs> from the Peterson Institute, who's here today, and, uh, and we have uh, these uh, trade forecasts. Um, uh, we believe that the uh, U.S. exports to China would be rise to around $530 billion, uh, in 2022. Um, this is really an average of all the projections that, uh, that uh, we have obtained from various sources. Um, this is more than three times the current value, so it's a huge increase. Um, 2022 Chinese exports to U.S. we project would be around 800, a little bit above 800 billion. Um, a, uh, but and despite the much higher rate of growth of U.S. exports of goods and services to China since 20, 2007, uh, Chinese trade surplus with the U.S. is likely to remain high in 2022. Okay, our estimate is 275 billion. Um, it is about 1.5 percent of the then Chinese GDP. Um, however, it is expected that China will run a trade deficit with the rest of the world at the time. Okay, so overall Chinese surplus uh, should be uh, less than you know one percent of GDP at that time. Um, this shows you how the uh, what the projected bilateral trade projections and um, the. Uh, Red line is Chinese exports to the U.S. The blue line is U.S. exports to China. You can see very rapid increase in in the blue line, but uh, still, I mean, because of the differences in the base, uh, you know, the uh, deficit, uh, Chinese uh, U.S. trade deficit vis-a-vis -vis China would would remain uh, you know, relatively high. But this shows you that the rates of growth that we use in the past, uh, as well as the projected rates of growth, you can see that. Since 2007, the blue columns, which indicate the uh, U.S. rates of growth, uh, grow, rates of growth of U.S. exports to China, uh, have consistently been higher uh, than the uh, uh, Chinese, uh, the rate of growth of Chinese exports to the U.S. I think I think this trend is likely uh, to continue, and, uh, and but but despite this, uh, I think the uh, uh, you know China we still have a trade surplus. Um, what are, what are some of the impacts we look at of this trade, bilateral trade on uh, employment and GDP? Um, we, we, uh, we have, uh, using input-output tables uh, constructed uh, both by the Chinese Academy of Sciences as well as by the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis of the United States, uh, we have actually done some projections. We, we believe that the, uh, the uh, uh, 
Uh, okay, I guess it's, it's not quite not quite here yet. Um, this is, uh, is I'm sorry. This is uh, am I, um, okay. The the right the right investment actually uh, has been uh, quite quite significant. I think it is currently running about five billion in both directions. Okay, the, you know, roughly speaking, uh, current rates. Um, the stock of U.S. direct investment in China is somewhere between 54 uh, billion and 70 billion, somewhere along uh, along there. The uh, um, and then the uh, stock of uh, U.S. Chinese direct investment in the U.S. is not quite 10 billion at this moment, but it's actually uh, slated to grow uh, in the future. Um, the uh, um, the U.S. direct investment in China has been quite successful, generating almost 40 billion of annual profits, and also creating uh, about 1.8 million jobs in China. Um, the Chinese service sector is relatively mature, um, so that the there's and the U.S. has the most sophisticated uh, service sector uh, in the world, um, and uh, so there's lots of room for the U.S. to either export services to China or to invest in China in the service sector and to help the, um, actually to help China to expand its service sector, creating more jobs uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Chinese. Um, the, uh, uh, let me go back to this uh, impact on, on, on employment and, uh, and GDP. Um, the, we projected that in 2022, U.S. exports to China uh, will actually uh, generate uh, $456 billion worth of value added to GDP uh, in, in the United States. And this, this is really about 2.2% of uh, the then projected U.S. GDP. And we believe that it would create about 2.5 million jobs uh, in, in the U.S. because of this, uh, uh, this trade. Um, similarly, uh, on the uh, Chinese side, um, you know, the, uh, we believe that an estimated value added of uh, about uh, over 500 billion, or three percent of the Chinese GDP, uh, uh, then Chinese GDP, and total employment of about 12 million. Okay, um, if you think about it, these are really very large numbers, and it actually testified to the fact that the uh, potential economic inter interdependence is really. Uh, really huge for the two countries. Um, what are some potential areas of cooperation? Um, we have identified seven areas of uh, cooperation in our study. Um, this doesn't mean that there aren't others. Uh, we, we just have enough uh, uh, time to take care of these seven, which we believe uh, uh, have uh, the most promise. Uh, trade, investment in agriculture, tourism, science and technology, energy, and global sustainability. Um, the, uh, given the expected growth of Chinese economy as well as middle class uh, in the coming decade, China is likely to overtake Canada and Mexico as the United States' largest market. Um, one projection done by McKinsey uh, 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 it, it basically uh, projects that the Chinese middle class will grow from its current 230 million to 630 million in 2022. Um, the uh, now, regardless, I mean, the spending power, the consumption power of uh, Chinese households would be increasing very dramatically uh, over this period. Um, prospects of U.S. direct investment in China are excellent. And we know that General Motors is already the market leader in the Chinese automobile industry, um, and. Uh, the Walmart is China's largest retailer, um, and uh, McDonald's and KFC, uh, Starbucks, these are all household names in China. Um, potential for these and other U.S. businesses yet to invest directly in China is actually enormous. Um, Chinese direct investment in the U.S. can also create many new jobs. I think we are just at seeing the beginning stage of this, uh, as well as the GDP. And, and I think especially if the investment is a greenfield investment, that is, you know, we have a new investment, creating new jobs, uh, and uh, creating new, uh, new value added. Um, now, one major concern of China and its people uh, are food security and food safety. Okay, yeah. is there enough food to feed everyone? Um, is the food safe and hygienic? You know, China has a limitation of arable land. It has uh, 
only 7% of Chinese uh, land area is potentially arable. And then the demands for urbanization uh, you know, is, is slowly you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, basically taking over the land, even though the Chinese government is committed you know, to a red line that, you know, that the arable land would not fall below a certain amount. But demand will keep increasing as urbanization increases. So there is actually a lot of room for the China and US to cooperate in agriculture. The United States has the most sophisticated agricultural technology uh, as well as the systems to ensure food safety uh, in the world. Abundance of arable land and actually water, high productivity and efficiency of US agriculture uh, mean that the US has the capability to further increase its uh, agricultural production as well as exports to China and help China ensure its food security as well as food safety at the same time. Um, I think both countries can uh, benefit greatly through such uh, cooperation. Um, the uh, uh, other, Another area would be tourism in 2012, you know, ap about 1.5 million tourists. I'm not completely sure about this number, could be higher, um, but anyway. Um, this number is expected to uh, exceed 5 million a year by 2022, and uh, if these are, uh, you know, procedures is uh, streamlined, but uh, it would actually could be projected to go to 10 million uh, per year uh, if, in fact, well, wafer visas are waived altogether by bo on both sides, on both countries. Um, the, uh, we, we have done some studies, uh, and then the, uh, what we have come up with is that 1 million Chinese tourists will create about 3.5 billion of GDP and, about, and more than 60,000 jo jobs. Okay, so if you multiply this by 10, you're looking at a potential of uh, 600,000 uh, jobs, which is really, uh, really quite significant. Um, the other areas would be in energy. China today, some of you may know, uh, relies overwhelmingly on coal as a source of energy. About 70% of Chinese primary energy is supplied uh, through coal. And we know that burning coal has many effects and pollutes the, the atmosphere. Um, and, but it also uh, you know, emits excess greenhouse gases. Um, China has very large deposits of shale oil and gas. And the and the China welcomes the investment and technological cooperation of U.S. firms in the shale oil and gas industry, and this can help China reduce its dependence on coal as a source of energy, and this benefits not just U.S. firms uh, uh, and China, but also re will help reduce significantly the Chinese carbon emissions and has the risk of global climate change. Um, you know, we know that when you switch from coal to gas, you know, the emissions are actually reduced uh, by 50%, and some people claim even 100%, you know, so that it would greatly, imp it would greatly improve the air in Beijing, for those of you who have, <laughs> who have visited uh, Beijing. Um, the, uh, there's also the p potential cooperation in the provision of global public goods. Um, the U.S. and China is the two largest energy consuming and producing uh, countries in the world, can cooperate to improve uh, energy efficiency, assure energy security, and promote research on the renewable source of energy. Um, uh, the uh, U.S. and China also as the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases. Uh, should take common responsibility for the reduction of the risks of climate change uh, and cooperate to forge a global consensus in the forthcoming negotiations relating to the uh, uh, control of global emissions. I believe that uh, you know, there would be another meeting uh, towards the end of this year. Um, you know, one of the things is that if the U.S. and China can have a common uh, approach, uh, some thing, things may be possible, but if they have very different approaches, I think things are basically impossible, okay? The cooperation between the two countries do not necessarily guarantee that things will happen, but if they don't cooperate, you know, clearly, you know, things will not happen. Um, finally, uh, the U.S. and China as the two largest trading countries in the world should also take the lead in reinvigorating the Doha rung of world trade negotiations as well as enhancing the multilateral trading system, benefiting not just themselves, but also uh, the rest of the world economy. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. I think uh, that gives us a very good sense of what's in the report, but I would recommend that you read it as well uh, and get, get uh, more of the color. So, Mike? Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Matt, thank you for having us. Um, my, uh, somewhere along in this process, uh, some, some part of our team suggested that somebody ought to look at the evolution of the global economy, the Chinese economy, and the United States economy in the next 10 years, which seems like almost everything. And so somebody said, why don't we get Spence to do that? And uh, so I did. It's one of the chapters in part two. Uh, and now I have 10 minutes uh, to tell you a bit about that. And the reason we wanted to do this is that the world is changing really quite quickly around all of us. And if we're going to try to find over time, sequentially, way, ways in which we can cooperate and, and, and help each country and indeed our uh, brethren in other countries achieve their goals, then we need to have some sense uh, that's not trapped in historical reality of how this is going. So let me, let me give it a try. I'll start with the global economy. We are, in a sense, at a turning point that many of you know about, the developing countries as a group. Uh, who have about 85% of the world's population and a minimal part for much of the post-war period of the global economy are now half the global economy. And that fraction is rising very rapidly because of a, 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 an accelerating and spreading pattern of growth in the developing world. Um, obviously, China is at the core of that. Now, this growth, you know, shares are always a zero-sum situation because they add up to 100, but this, this, this growth in the share of developing countries is going to be produced by large-scale absolute growth uh, in those economies and therefore in the global economy uh, to support, you know, one of the many things that Larry covered. We're talking about, if things go well, a global economy that in the next 25 to 30 years will triple in size. And nobody that I know believes that if we try to, to make that journey on what, what you might call the old growth model, including the, the old way of using natural resources that our planet gives us, nobody thinks we'll get to the end of the journey without a major disruption. So for sure, uh, these two countries having such a dominant position in it are going to have to have a leadership role in inventing over time a, a, an adjusted growth model that's consistent with the natural resources that, that our planet has. Now, in this growth uh, in the developing world, China has a, an absolutely central position. It is the sort of high growth core. I, I did the following exercise a, 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 about a couple of weeks ago. I took the other BRICs and Mexico and Indonesia and added up their GDP, and it came to just larger than the Chinese. GDP. So China's at about half the size of the European and American economies right now. At these growth rates, it'll be on a 10 to 15 year horizon where people differ where you fall in that interval. It'll be about the same size as our economies, at which point they'll have a per capita income of somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the advanced countries. So, so size and, 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 and individual income and wealth are two di very different things. The journey to being comparable in terms of incomes is much, much longer. The developing countries are also what is sometimes called partially decoupled. The post-crisis experience has indicated that unlike the past, I mean, if 25 years ago you had a disruption in the advanced economies of the magnitude that we've now experienced and continue to experience, that would have immediately killed a substantial fraction of the growth in the developing world. That has not happened now. So these economies are resilient because they have big domestic markets. They are richer and demand things beyond housing, energy, and, uh, and food. They trade with each other a lot. Uh, now that doesn't mean when we, I live in Milan, so we're kind of the epicenter of global systemic risk now. If we have a huge, uh, Def downturn, um, that, w that will and is already adversely affecting growth pretty much ev everywhere. Let me make one more point before d d turning to, the, uh, to the two econ these two economies, and that is at some very deep level, our interests are aligned, even though we are living through a changing world. Uh, 
if you go to China and say, apart from getting the job done internally, what would you most like to see happen in the global economy? They will respond, we'd like to see a full recovery in Europe over time, and we'd like to see the growing pattern of restored growth uh, and health in the American economy to continue. And if you sit and go around to these other places, you know, you will get similar answers vis-a-vis -vis the other two. The, the bottom line is, w even though we have a tendency to focus on the frictions and the mistrust and the other things that divide us, at some very deep level, we don't have an interest in a failure in these three now core systemic parts of the global economy. Now, China is going through the middle income transition. Um, some people use the word trap. I don't like the term because there are counterexamples. Uh, uh, Japan, the Taiwanese economy, and South Korea are among those who went through the middle income transition at high speed. But the fact is that those of us who study developing country growth patterns and stages will, will, will know this, that the vast majority of countries that enter the middle income transition either slow down or stop completely. In fact, the vast majority of the developing world now, as measured by GDP, is somewhere in the middle income transition trying to accelerate out. Um, you will get various opinions on China. I'm on the optimistic side. I think China will manage these very substantial structural changes that go along with the middle income transition. They have a, a history of, uh, of uh, tackling these things with great uh, skill. It is one of the most open economies with respect that I've ever been in, uh, in the developing world with respect to understanding the positive and negative experiences in other countries and learning from them. Um, it, this is not the occasion to discuss the bits and pieces of this transition. To suffice it to say they are major, major structural changes on the supply and demand side. But if it all works out, this is an economy that will be on the, on, in terms of demand, a major opportunity. The McKinsey Global Institute uh, wrote one of the chapters for, uh, for this study and estimates that the middle class group in China, now numbering 230 million, will rise to well over 600 million in the next 10 years. That's uh, on the order of double the American population. This is a, an essential part of the growth model in China but it's also a huge, huge opportunity for virtually every other country. I should say that the network structure of the global economy is such now that for a, a large and growing list of countries, China is their major external market. That would include India, Brazil, Australia, most of Southeast Asia, and a, great, and a growing list of countries. So, and a, and, a, and a major halt in China would slow their growth virtually immediately. Not stop it, there's some endogenous growth engines, but slow it. Um, now let me say a few words about the American economy and then close with some general thoughts about this kind of cooperation. Uh, the two presidents are meeting uh, in Los Angeles at the start of June, very soon. We all hope uh, that they feel confident about the reforms and, and structural adjustments in their own, own economy and that they manage to get a number of things done. One obviously will be, ad be addressing the sort of inconsistencies in our system and the frictions and mistrust that result from it. We all hope that they, uh, that they also address a rather more fundamental question that Henry Kissinger talked about yesterday, which is, what it, what do we want these two economies to look like and how do we want them to relate 10 years from now as a context for an ongoing process of, of the more detailed job of figuring out uh, you know, how we cooperate. Uh, this isn't a one-shot effort. We're, we're hoping this establishes a pattern of cooperation where we discover over time. And the last thing that we hope these two countries do is to think carefully about the roles they want to play as leaders in, in providing a global context that's stable. Now, the good news is the American economy is recovering, uh, uh, probably much better than we ever would have thought of, even you know, nine months ago. We have increased competitiveness in the tradable sector, employment and exports gener going there. Our deleveraging is quite far along, not complete. Uh, so the demand shock that we experienced in 2008, 2009, 
is starting to recede, the housing market is stabilizing, and we have the tailwinds of, uh, of renewed sources of relatively low cost and clean energy. So we're a little more confident uh, and maybe a little less inclined to focus only on our own. We have lots of issues. We are underinvesting as a country on the public sector side, and that probably won't go away soon. Uh, we have a tax system that was prominently featured on all the programs as a result of Tim Cook showing up <laughs> from Apple and being grilled and winning, uh, if you saw it. Uh, it's just nuts. Uh, so we've got lots of work to do but and a lot of the heavy lifting, but as, as CH said at the start, we believe that, that both in China and the United States this, this restructuring and establishing sustainable patterns of inclusive growth is hard work on both sides, but that if we, we can make a material difference with a cooperative uh, relationship. Finally, on the global economy, um, it's a relatively dangerous place right now. It's, uh, it's highly interdependent in evolving patterns. If you study global supply chains, you'll discover that they are becoming more and more complex. The network structure of the global economy is evolving very rapidly. There's some very good research, uh, including by the IMF, uh, for those of you who are interested on this. Uh, but the bottom line is that we are um, in a situation in which the interdependencies have outrun our capacity to manage, regulate, and oversee. Uh, so this is a potentially volatile world, and we all know at some level that this is not a, a pattern that we want to continue indefinitely. In my view, it's a generation's work to build the international capabilities and institutions uh, that uh, are capable of surrounding and providing the stability in this interdependent global world that we want. I, I remind myself occasionally that, you know, in much of the post-war period, this job uh, was done largely by advanced countries who dominated the global economy. Indeed, Americans, I think especially younger Americans, forget that America had the leadership role right after World War II in creating the fundamental character, the architecture of the global economy that's produced all of this growth and all of this optimism and opportunity in the developing world, and it's something that we should be quite proud of. But now we have a new job. Now we have got a highly diverse set of influential partners to work with, and, and I think the thing that we would all, our team would all agree on is that uh, if the United States and China at some point don't you know, join together and provide a leadership role in creating what are sometimes called cooperative non-equilibrium outcomes in the global economy, <laughs> as opposed to non-cooperative equilibrium outcomes that are sort of deficient in terms of um, Pareto efficiency, then probably nothing good will happen. That is, this is not a sufficient condition for effective global cooperation, but it's almost surely uh, a necessary condition. So we're optimistic uh, about these two economies and we're, and we're hopeful that, that the cooperative scenario starts to to dominate. There, we do not underestimate the challenges associated with achieving that, um, but we think it can be done with effective leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for ending on a note of, of optimism there. Um, Dr. Wong, would you like to speak here or there? Either is fine. And um, we are going to, um, Dr. Wang is going to speak in, in Mandarin, and uh, we will have a consecutive uh, interpreter. So. Uh, I'm very 昨天在纽约首先发布了，受到了各方面的好评。关于当前，哎，关于当前中国经济的发展情况，特别是对未来中国经济发展的态势，很多朋友都是十分关心的。我愿意借此机会谈点自己的看法，供大家参考。
I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here today for this uh, launch of this new report. And this report is a very important report in which Chairman uh, Tung was the principal researcher. And for the first time in this report, we see a deep look at the past, present, and future uh, of US-China uh, economic and trade relations, and it is objective as well as comprehensive. Uh, yesterday, um, in New York, uh, it was released, and it got excellent reviews. As for the current uh, economic situation and the future economic growth posture in China, a lot of our friends have expressed a lot of interest, and that's why I'm here today to talk a little bit with you about um, a few of my thoughts on that. So, yes, the way Zongo Jingji Fadan de Zosu. Taja Zodo, go to your size of the Nile, Zongo Pao Zola, Nian Zeng Rang Li, Jim Pai Fan de Suda Zeng Rang, Jingji Nian de Zeng Su, Yosho Xia Jiang. 这一方面是由于国际金融危机爆发的影响以提高经济发展质量和效益为中心中国第三产业的增加值增长速度已经达到了 uh, first of all, let's look at the direction that the Chinese economy is taking. Everybody knows that in the past 30 years or so, China uh, operated at about a 10% economic growth rate. And in the past few years, that rate has been down a little bit. And uh, that is due for in part to the international financial crisis as well as the external environment which went through some changes <laughs> and also uh, now at the same time the economic aggregates in China have reached a point where we are the number two largest in the world. Um, so the economic development right now is in a situation where there are major structural tensions, and it's very important for us to go about transforming the way our economy is developing and to tweak the economic structure. This is right now a task and a job where we have our work cut out for us, and it's also very urgent. So against that backdrop, the Chinese government has um, set up some goals to try to improve the quality as well as the efficiency of economic development and make that a main task. We will be working very hard to change, transform the industrial structure, um, upgrade it. Uh, in that process, the growth rate may come down a little bit. Um, a lot of countries have been through this before us, and a lot of scholars uh, think of this as sort of an unavoidable law of economic development. So what will happen will be that uh, this, our whole structure will improve while the rate, the growth rate itself, comes down a little bit. If we look at the statistics from quarter one uh, in 2013, the value added in the tertiary industries grew at 8.3% which is 0.5% higher than the way the value added in secondary industries grew. And these tertiary industries value added accounted for 
47.8% of GDP, which was up 1.6% year on year from last year. And this is a trend that's positive and that also is in keeping with our macroeconomic regulatory goals. Chanjur,还是包有乐观的。这是因为,第一,中国正处于工业化,成正化的关键时期,扩大内息的权力巨大。第二,中国将坚持生化改革,扩大开放,这也是中国未来发展的最大红利,这对全球经济发展也会带来
Ladies and gentlemen, China is a member of the great family of nations, and we are also one of the most important trading partners of the United States. We will continue, and we would like to continue to work together with all countries of the world uh, in the economic arena, and we are committed to the liberalization and the facilitation of opening up our trade and investment um, environments. In the, when it comes to uh, complementing each other, China and the United States are very complementary. Uh, if we do everything right, we can have a win-win situation, and I really hope that the two sides will uh, increase strategic trust between each other, and we'll work together in innovative ways, um, like, for instance, setting up a bilateral free trade zone between us. I hope that working together um, and doing all of this, we will bring about a better life and a better world for the peoples of both of our countries and make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong, and thank you, Vicky, for that uh, interpretation. Um, so we will now uh, do a little bit of a, a, a break. Uh, not, not you don't, you shouldn't get up. Uh, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to switch places here and put the panel up here. So if you could just uh, bear with us for about one minute, we're going to make a little, uh, do a little choreography here. You are welcome at any time to get coffee in the back, but please don't go anywhere because we're going to go.